Dr. Glenn Livingston. Welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, today we're, we're turning the tables um, because I want to talk about coaching and helping people and the ways in which I have um, altered and transformed how I work. And you're you're one of the people that I love talking to about this. And, and we have so many conversations and I am so grateful that you agreed to, to kind of come and help turn the tables and, and, and help me get out my message today. You know, it's a genuine honor. And um, I, I think you know that I've I lived a life of psychotherapy and coaching and, you know, helping profession kind of work. And I grew up in a family with 17 psychotherapists and I saw um, thousands of people over the years. And the reason I'm, I'm not saying that to, to brag, I'm saying that so that people understand when I say that I learned something from every conversation with you that, um, you know, it's a genuine honor to have the opportunity to pull this out of you and see what I'm going to learn. So um, oh. with, with that said, <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'll say that I, I know you for a lot of years. Um, how long is it, Howie? Like 15 I years? Eight, I would say 18. Yeah, I know you for a very long time. And we have a very um, kind of similar background in that we um, were – kind of PhDs looking to go into marketing so we could make more than a few bucks a year. Um, <laughs> and then we were PhDs who went out of marketing because we decided we'd like the helping professions better. Um, yeah. but, but and, we're, and we're both six foot tall or, or we're both more than six foot tall, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> and we both can juggle five balls, except for me, except for me. You can't do it anymore? I never could. I, I, oh, you! No way! I was close. I was close, but I, I didn't. I didn't put in the the elbow grease to really to really nail it. Well, I haven't been practicing for for a long time, oh. so um, I would like to hear the story of your coaching evolution. When mm. you first thought about helping people with health issues, with procrastination, with um, you know difficulty getting out of their own way. Yeah. How did you think to approach it? And then what's changed over the years? Yeah, that's great. Because I was only going to talk about the last year, but I love that you're, you know, asking me to think about a larger evolution. So I think probably I decided I was going to help people around, like I've been coaching, sort of business coaching um, since 2000, 2001. And that started not as coaching, but as consulting. Right. So, you know, we were we were both part of that crowd that got into Internet marketing early, understood or were, were taught and, and realized what it was and what it wasn't during the, you know, the dot com boom and crash. And we had a ton of expertise that we could share with people about here's what this is. Here's how to use it. Here's how to think about it. Here's what you got to do every day. Here's what you got to set up. And. I think what, what we both discovered is that through, people were very happy to pay us to tell them what to do. And then very often they just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Right. We were working with mostly with solo entrepreneurs or small teams, not like, you know, a big company. You, you, you have a, a previous career consulting with very, very large companies, Fortune 50, Fortune 10. Uh, I didn't. I just was, to, you know, in, in our little world of, of, of online entrepreneurs, I would say, you know, here's, hey, do this thing with AdWords or do this thing with your landing page or, or set up this, these metrics and check them every day and, and run these tests. And people are like, oh, thank you, thank you. And then we'd get on the phone next week and they still wouldn't know the lifetime value of a customer. They still wouldn't uh, have put in place sort of the basics. They still wouldn't have, this is the worst thing, they, they wouldn't have asked their customers anything. They wouldn't have done any market research and they're still, right? And so... It, it soon occurred to me that in order to get people to take my advice and benefit from it, I was going to have to work on a behavioral level. Mm -hmm. So I, so at that point, I really began studying what stops people from behaving in ways that clearly serve their own interests. And, you know, when you do that, you can kind of get caught up into the self-help movement. 
which around that time with the, with the rise of the internet was really bifurcating before it had been sort of a very feminine space and it was becoming a very masculinized what do you space mean? What do you around mean by that? like you know toughen up put on your oh, big boy pants yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know knock on a hundred you know, so so you know the the self help uh, advice you and I were getting at the conferences we were going to very often came from weightlifters, bodybuilders, martial artists. Yeah, very machismo kind of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And people who had spent their childhood selling Fuller Brush and, and just, you know, one rejection after the other, how to stick your foot in the door before it gets closed on you. As it's, opposed to, come here, let me give you a hug. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like tough, you know, and, and it played into a whole thing that I think, you know, Tony Robbins had really made popular around like your state determines your behavior and you get to choose your state. And so it was a very sort of ethos of self-responsibility, self-accountability, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, don't complain, don't whine, be tough, get up, do it again, fall down eight times, get up nine. And honestly, I found that extremely helpful mm -hmm. for myself. It was, mm -hmm. it was a corrective. And I embraced it. And that was that was how I started. Just sort of, you know, when people wouldn't do it, I didn't give them a lot of slack. I was mm -hmm. like, well, do you want this or not? Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't, somebody else will. Mm -hmm. right? And that worked for some people. And it's a, you know, it's not a message you necessarily get in school. It's not a message everyone necessarily gets in their family. It also skewed politically very right wing. So it was kind of weird for me. I was for years. Because you were not, around. you were not on that side of the aisle at all. Yeah. No, I was going yeah. like I'm. 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 You know, I'm very left wing for other people, but I'm very right wing for myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that so, that helped. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, so okay. So in the early days, you had a corrective emotional experience and were more masculinized um, by the coaching and emotional support that was available in the marketing world. Mm -hmm. But you're framing this in such a way to say that that's not the end of the story. <laughs> not the end of the story. Yeah. Right. What happened? God, I love how you can put things in like just succinct things like, oh, that's a thing. It exists. I, I, I love that about you and our conversations. <laughs> no. Um, so, like, so, so, like, psychology is a lot about vocabulary. <laughs> we work hard to have vocabulary to describe human yeah. experience so yeah yeah talking to you yeah. i often feel like i'm I, i'm spending ten thousand words to describe this thing that's sort of round and red with with yellow in the middle and you go <laughs> oh an apple <laughs> well anyway your, your apple yeah. evolved into an orange or a banana what, what happened yeah yeah well then when after i got this opportunity to work with t colin campbell and write a couple of books with him and he was so generous as to put my name on the cover and, and promote me to the the plant-based community I was like, well, gee, I can do some good here. I was kind of bored with marketing, uh, or if not bored, then a little, even a little bit ashamed, like mm -hmm. wasting my life, not enjoying it. It was not mm -hmm. a good fit. And I'm like, well, here I can go into health and I can help the world become plant-based. And as I began to look into that and I started looking at sort of, you know, health coaching and what we knew about health and habits, I just sort of adopted a very sort of mainstream approach around and, and I really didn't question it. So it's like, oh, okay, here, you know, for internet marketing, here were the tools that worked. Great. I'm going to use them. Nobody else is practically because it was just a handful of us. I'm going to do the same thing in health. And, and I just adopted without questioning like, oh, well, you need your big why and you need to set up your environment and, and all things, again, that were very useful. They have a lot of empirical evidence behind them. Uh, but it's still, it was still, it's it still felt like, um, I want to say sort of very, very functional problems that were easily solved. Like you just had to tell people like, okay, do this. And that's the result you'll get. Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay. So make up your morning routine. When are you going to put it on your calendar? Time block, right? So sort of basic transactional stuff. But, but it wasn't addressing the gap that most people have between knowing what to do and being able to do it. It was to a teeny extent because the part of the gap of knowing what to do and being able to do it is environmental and it is structural, 
right? Like if you've t if and a lot of what I was doing was just giving people permission to do smart things. I see. Right. Like, you mean I, I don't have to exercise for an hour? I could exercise for 20 minutes? Is that okay? <laughs> and I'm going, what do you think? Is it what's better, nothing or 20 minutes? And they go, oh, right. <laughs> so Sometimes I don't, people again, are just saying things out loud and um, getting permission from an authority is all they need to do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So again, I think this, you know, and also for me, this was very helpful to think about, okay, what are the best practices for living a healthy life? <clears throat> you know, things like batch cooking, <clears throat> things like when do you shop, pantry management, <clears throat> right? So it wasn't like the gap between knowing and doing was the gap between, okay, I don't have anything in my pantry and I know I should eat healthy. So what do I do? Got it. To, okay, now I've got good stuff in my pantry because I have developed this shopping habit. And now, you know, so a whole bunch of people could now be healthier than they had been before. So again, really useful stuff, a useful part of my evolution. But as you foreshadowed, not enough, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't going to help everybody. So what was next? Uh, next was I met Josh Lajani. Uh, I met him through a Facebook post from Garth Davis, my, my second uh, co-author in the health space. Um, we wrote the book Proteinaholic, and Garth had posted a picture of Facebook of the most astounding before and after set I had ever seen of a guy, you know, 420 pounds, sad, everything about his body and his affect was kind of down and depressed. Second picture was him crossing the finish line at a marathon, <laughs> smiling, like muscles up to here, extremely handsome. I met him. Like, yeah. 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 I'm like, whoa. So I reached out. Um, hey, you know, I'd love to have you on the podcast. And he wrote back. And he's like, wait, are you the Howard Jacobson who wrote Hole, who helped Colin write Hole? I'm like, yeah. And it's like, oh. so we're totally fanboying each other. And he had written a chapter that he'd never shown to anyone, not even his wife, about his life and his transformation. And I'm like, dude, can we work on your book? This is amazing. So he came up and his story was completely different from most things I had learned. So the one thing that I had really taken away from the habit work I was doing was make it as easy as possible. Uh -huh. Like, you know... So don't do hard exercise, do easy exercise. Don't go all the way, go, just go a little bit, right? Progress, not perfection. Mm -hmm. Josh was completely the opposite. We went, you know, I said, he, he was a runner. So I said, well, if I'm going to write a book with you, I want to experience that too. I want to be kind of participatory journalist. So what do you say we go for a run? We went for a run the, the first morning he was there and he left me, you know. Like, in, in the dust. In yeah. the dust, except he didn't. He kept on sort of slowing up to make sure I was still alive. Cresting yeah, but that's hell. even more annoying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he came to visit me. So I, like, I knew how to get home. It was like yeah, we, did right, a, right. we did a seven-mile loop. <laughs> right. Very, very hilly. And by the end of it, I was in agony. And when I got to the, my mailbox, I had never felt prouder of myself. It's like, dang. And I told him, like, the thought I had, I, I admitted to this to him like months later, says the thought I had was, well, good for you, Josh, you're not carrying 20 extra pounds, which I was at the time. And, the, you know, the thought, no, in fact, I, I said that to him later the after, in that afternoon, after we had spent several hours talking about his story and he was being very vulnerable and forthcoming. So that later that afternoon, I said, you know, I want to tell you something that I'm not proud of, but when, like, I was comparing myself to you on that run and thinking, boy, you know, it's gr great for you to not have 20 extra pounds on you. And we went for a run again the next morning and the fucker was wearing a 20 pound weight vest. <laughs> she happened to have brought with him. It's almost evil. Yeah. <laughs> and with the same thing, this time he was not nearly as nice. He was not waiting for me. He, I had to catch up. And again, tough guy coaching. Tough guy tough coaching. Guy coaching. Yeah. And the way he told his story was I had to become a tough guy. I had to love the pain. 
Uh And, you know, forget about like little steps. I had to go all the way. I had to break up with po' boys. I had to break up with alcohol. I had to, you know, and it was like back to this, this tough guy stuff. But now it was not not just mental, it was physical. He was like, you have got to experience suffering and embrace it. And that's what you got to do if you want to change your life. And I was like, whoa, that's so different from like, okay, what's the easiest thing you could do? Where's your 80-20? What's mm-hmm. the one little thing you can do now that will, mm-hmm. right? And, and I adopted that. And we, we created um, programs together. We did the big change program, which was bought out by Wellstart Health. And everything I was doing was now based on the Josh model. And so I was back to, you know, really tough love. It was love. It was always with a smile. It was never, it was never, you know, you're a bad person, but Glenn, isn't it silly the way you're thinking about this? Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Yep. I've been there too. So it was, it was never, a, it was never a form of superiority, but it was like, you know, we, we used phrases like, um, we borrowed a phrase from a book called, um, what is it? Organized tomorrow today. And the phrase was, um, win your fight throughs. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and again, very valuable. You talk about this all the time that you can't defeat a craving unless you are having the craving. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So that experience of, okay, now you're in the shit. What are you going to do about it? Embrace the suck, that sort of thing. And I, then I uh, encountered a phrase that Dan Ariely, behavioral scientist had written about called benign masochism. Mm-hmm. And he had, he'd been studying people who do CrossFit and triathletes who revel in how how much that workout sucked mm-hmm. right? and how bad they felt after so, you know so, so you you had a transformational experience by being exposed to this philosophy you you became more of a tough guy yes. you embraced your own benign masochism and i imagine you started embracing that in your coaching as well trying to encourage Absolutely. people yeah Absolutely. and what happened what, what results did you get with the people that you work with when you did that so some people just took to it and they were like, oh, like this philosophy is exactly what I need. And they just, they, you know, ran away with it. They, be, you know, they, they became athletes. They, um, you know, joined boxing gyms. They, you know, could do five minute planks. They're mm-hmm. like, oh, like they saw the light. And mm-hmm. this was what they needed. This was the, the missing nutrient. And, their, and just in, to, just to be clear, at this point, you were primarily in health coaching. You were not doing as much business coaching anymore. Right. I had transitioned. I was doing some. Um, and the nice thing about business coaching is that you only have to do some to make a living. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the other thing about business coaching is that you don't coach businesses. You coach owners and owners have health problems that interfere with their productivity and decision making. So it's not really as clear a distinction as we're making it out to be. Um, it was, the, the only distinction was how many zeros are at the at the end of my <laughs> my, fee, of my fee. Honestly, B- businesses pay more for for health coaching than consumers do. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, they think they're paying for business coaching, right? But it really yeah. is behavioral coaching. What are you going to do today? Is the mm-hmm. only you know what are you going to do next? Is the only yeah. question that coaches ever have Agreed. to deal with. Agreed. Right. So. Agreed. And again, you know, and even even if I'm talking about again, like marketing or leadership or team building or personal effectiveness or communication, the con the content may change, but the the coaching process is very similar, mm-hmm. right? It's about committing to action and seeing what the results are and adapting, right? So all the all the tools, you know, I don't think of them as different at all. You know, and when I when I coach someone, I'll say, well, so what what difference would you like our work to make for you? And it doesn't matter what they say. Right. But so you didn't. This is not the end of the story. You you did not become, um, you know, Sergeant Jacobson who whipped people into shape. You felt like something was missing. What what was the chink in the armor? Why doesn't it work to you know, just be a sergeant when you're trying to get people to do what's good for them. Yeah. Well, there were two problems and one took longer to to recognize than the other, but they both took longer than they might have for me to recognize. Uh One of them was not everybody was getting 
the results they wanted. And that's a, that was a fairly obvious thing that some people just weren't doing. It. Uh -huh. Now, the reason that took too long is that embedded in that ethos is a little whiff of blame the victim. I see. Right? Uh -huh. Like, okay, well, you don't want it bad enough. Again, right. It was, right. Right. Well, so if you're not, you know, what do you want? Do you want, do you want your diabetes or do you want health? Right. Like you chose it. Right. Fight harder. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so it took and, me a and, while. And, 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 and so, I mean, if I can just um, uh -huh. reframe yeah, yeah. that, I think what's missing from the sergeant only variety of, of coaching is that um, we need to figure out how to help get people better in spite of themselves. It, it, it doesn't acknowledge the that there is a self-destructive nature in most human beings and there's a self-destructive part of us that needs to be um, elicited and um, there needs to be some compassion for how it developed and what purpose it solved and what survival value it had so that the person can release that self-destructive nature and do the things that the sergeant is telling them to do. And, and so you can't really beat that into someone you you have to have compassion for what they're going through and how it all came about in order to um in order to get them through that's that would be the way that i described it is that what you're thinking yeah i think i think we're going to get into that and i would um use a little bit different terminology i okay. think and and it may, and i may be i may be wrong but i think it helps it's helping me at this moment and I'm also well aware that at some point in the future, we could have a conversation in which we look back on me now and say, boy, look at these things I did not understand. I know. So, I know. so I, I, every 10 years when I think about how I used to coach, even though people said it was great and I was getting all these results, I think, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I want to take those podcasts off the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yes. so put it in your words. Put it in your words. Um, well, so I want, I, want to, um, I want to get there. Um, no but I think, so like, I don't, I don't want it to seem like I was an asshole or exclusively an asshole. Cause there were people who definitely told me that I was a little too much that I was, you know, I, they Howie, I, don't, I don't think anybody would ever describe you like that. I I've always, I've always experienced compassion from you, um, much more so than all the people around us. And, um, I, I get that feedback from people who have heard our interviews on the, I don't think anybody would ever mm -hmm. describe you like that. But anyway, okay. go ahead. Good. Well, I won't go. introduce you to them then. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll, we'll keep the firewall up. You're such Jewish humor. Go ahead. So, <laughs> <laughs> so but, you know, I, I think I always expressed compassion, but it was compassion for a pathology. Right. And the thing that just shouldn't be there. And, uh -huh. and I loved eliciting that moment where people just felt, oh, look how dumb I've been. Yes. Now we got there. Uh -huh. right. um, so so one, one, one problem was that there were people who were simply it was, wasn't working for. You know, regardless, I was still nice. They still liked me. They still wanted to hang out with me. They still paid me for maybe, you know, more months than they would have had I been a jerk. Uh -huh. But they still, they were not making that much progress. Uh -huh. The second thing that I think made me realize that I was hitting a dead end here, that, there, that this wasn't the be all and the end all, was in January 2019, I injured myself to the point where running became very painful. And I had been, I, Josh had helped me turn myself into an ultra marathoner. Mm -hmm. I had done, you know, three, I think, 50 Ks. I'd done four marathons. I was, you know, looking at races, like, what's the next thing? Is there a hundred I can do? Can I, you know? Yeah. Wow. Is, is there any, is there any broken glass involved? Just, you know, like really, you know, because when you get into the ultra running world, you, you get, you really get ahead of this ethos of mm -hmm. know, the, the great stories are the people who run with broken bones in their feet. Wow. You know, who the David who, Goggins. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he, be, you know, he became the epitome of, of that, of that ethos. Right. Tough in the F up. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing the people in my cohort who had been doing this. And most of them, uh, to be fair, 
had been extremely obese. So I was a little bit different. I just had this, this foot injury. I got a Morton's neuroma. I'm like, what, Morton, whoever he is, fuck him. Because <laughs> this thing just, I still have it. It's still, you know, sort of twinges on my right foot between the third and fourth toes. Um, and it may, it, you know, I ran 150K with it. And I was just so miserable. And I started, you know, talking to Josh and other people who were also having like pain and problems and doing damage to ourselves. And there was a way in which we couldn't get out of it. It's like there was no other path except like if, if the path is to toughen up, you know, sweet cakes mm -hmm. and you're injured, the only tool was to toughen up some more. OK, well, now you got an injury. Work through that. OK, sure. Go to go to rehab. But now, you know what? Toughen up in the gym. Work those core muscles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, more and more people I saw, like, not, you know, some people can run their whole lives and maybe they're, you know, they take the time to learn proper form and maybe they're rehab, yeah, you know, whatever it is, for some reason, a bunch of us were breaking down. And when we broke down physically in terms of what we could do with our bodies, other things started breaking down as well, mm -hmm. like our peace of mind our ability to make good food choices. Huh? Like this thing we thought we had locked down through force of will. Mm -hmm. it, tur it turns out that that force of will didn't seem to be an endlessly renewable resource. Mm -hmm. Seems like most of us had about a five-year supply of it. Mm -hmm. And some of us stay in the, stayed in the public limelight as you know health influencers, and we had to put on a good show and some of us, you know, stopped appearing on video. We just did audios. And some of us, you know, were more or less vulnerable about what we were going through. But it took a long time for me to say, boy, this, this being tough on myself is not working. It's not getting me the results I want. And in fact, it seems to be backfiring in some pretty <laughs> significant ways. <laughs> and it made me kind of want to give up. Like, oh, what did I do? And what have I, what have I been telling people? And how so, many people out there have been getting great results and are going to hit the same wall? It's like, you know, that I think movie Limitless where Bradley Cooper keeps taking this drug that makes him, you know, incredibly brilliant. And, and after a while they realize, oh, it's actually killing him. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there, there's, an, there's a um, mildly manic element to what you were describing with the um, aggressive pursuit of discipline, no matter what, which is not, it's not stable, it's not maintainable. And so eventually people crash. I think that's what you're describing. So that that was about five years ago. And then, then what's your journey was, been like since then? That was really until, yeah, I guess the pandemic was, what was it, three years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, so... I mean, I, I developed, I, I added other tools. So, what, you know, one of the tools that I added was your work around, around binge and craving. And that, which, which, which is also, also used to be tougher than it is now. I've actually uh -huh. also, also soft, softened up in the last couple of years, but go, go ahead. Yeah. I think we've, yeah. we've sort of got on. We've Maintained gone so the many... dialogue and you've been part of that evolution. Yeah. Right. I, and, I, and... I used to think it was all about being really tough with that, you know, inner pig and, you know, telling it that it was wrong. And, and now I think it, it, that's part of it, but it really also has to do with um, self-care and, and preventing false sense of emergency and attending to the things you haven't been attending to in your life. Anyway, this is not my interview. This yeah. is your interview. So yeah. tell me more. No, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy when you speak because I, <laughs> I like the, I like the sound of your voice better. <laughs> so, and, and you have been such, you have been such an integral part your work has been such an integral part of my work and my growth that I think Thanks, it, buddy. It makes, Same here. Same I think here. But, it I, but, I really want to, but I really want to know what happened. So, so yeah. you, you had an epiphany. It was a painful epiphany that the tough guy approach has its limitations and actually could cause people to crash in some ways. Yeah. Um, and how did you correct for that? What did you do? So one of the things that, that helped, um, and I, I have not been a fan of cognitive behavioral approaches. Uh -huh. And they, you know, they have felt very body, very mind-based, you know, intellectual, 
Um, I know a lot of people who who basically learned that their thinking was faulty and then they were even worse because they felt like now I know it's faulty and I'm still doing it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I discovered that was sort of um, took some of the better parts of cognitive behavioral therapy, but wrapped it in something that I was more comfortable with was something called ACT, acceptance oh, okay. and commitment therapy, mm -hmm. which also, oh, I just threw my pen over there. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Hell yeah. <laughs> the, the tyranny of the written word. <laughs> so go ahead. So, so you, you encountered ACT. ACT. When I tell people what that is, just so that they know that. Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it's a form was developed by a bunch of people, in, including Stephen Hayes. And it was based on, it's based on Buddhism. It's based on cognitive therapy. It's based on so, a lot of neuroscience. It's based on an entire linguistic model of how or how language is is, is created relationally um, and it also had the benefit of like your work was absolutely central to, to so i you know i started saying oh act is like the bigger picture of glenn's work of glenn's work that's funny it, it was it was kind of like everything you were doing was a, a specific application for eating and binging Mm -hmm. of this and so like oh mm -hmm. so here's here's a larger frame so it talked about things like diffusion where diffusion d e f u s o n as in as in not fusing with a voice right it was it was all about like you can't erase voices but you don't have to pay it. you don't have to identify with them which is you know you don't you don't have to nurture them you can separate from them yeah yeah so it you know it was also um one of those things that that brought me more compassion for that voice because it was never about never make it feel bad right thank you it always you know you'd say well thank you for that suggestion or you know it's good to hear from you i take i i'm glad you care right it was very sort of which differs from stuff. the way that i do it but go ahead yeah right and it differed yeah. it differed much more from the way you did it mm -hmm. right so yes mm -hmm. so that that kind of started softening me up um, then I, 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 you know, I, I do an, I've done an interview a week with people on the podcast for over 10 years now. And occasionally some of those interviews just like punch my lights out. Mm -hmm. Transformative. Of, oh, and yeah. one of those was with Philip Shepard, who's, who has written um, Radical Wholeness. New, new world, new self, and most recently, deep fitness. And he's an embodiment coach. And one of the things that he was talking about was, you know, this mind-body split that we have in Western civilization. And it's not universal. And there's places in the world where they think of the, 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 the essence of the soul or the person is in the, the heart or the belly. And it's not divided. And, and so instead of like listening to your body, he points out that like that's the best we can do is listening to the body as if your body is on the other side of a door and you're sticking your ear against the, the, the wood trying to hear something faint. Mm -hmm. um, so like this whole thing of like, I'm going to be tough. You know, I'm going to make myself do it. The, the, in fact, he used like the, talks about the word mastery. If there's a master, then there's also a servant or a slave or. Right. And so it's like, what, what if you were just unified and you weren't in this internal struggle of which he says, you know, self-discipline is essentially an eternal struggle. Mm -hmm. and that, that really got me thinking about how to help people align with something deeper with, with, you know, a body wisdom. Like we, you know, in the health field, we know that the body is so much wiser than the mind, mm -hmm. right? You give the body a Snickers bar, it will do amazing things with it. It will do the best it can. Right? It'll turn it into calories. It will it will excrete what it can. It will use the caffeine and the chocolate for energy, right? Whatever you throw at your body, it's going to be like, I'll you know, I wasn't meant for this, but you know, watch me. If this is what's available, then I'm I'm here to survive. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Trump is almost eighty. Like his body's doing a hell of a job, given what he, how he's supposed to be. and exercise retirement. <laughs> I know. I know, but but, but again, I'm I'm having trouble understanding what what the end point is or, or yeah. what, uh, what where 
where yeah. you wind up and how you've changed your coaching over the last year or so, because I know that's what you want to be get across. Yeah. So the the thing that, that um, the, the big thing that I changed, um, and this was, these were all like looking back, all these little evolutions were setting me up for, for where I am now, but I didn't, I didn't sort of, you know, I couldn't see it until mm-hmm. I got to this particular plateau. Mm-hmm. And uh, someone, someone told me about IFS, internal family systems, which mm-hmm. I'd heard about. And people were like, oh, you should read, you know, Richard Swartz and you should look at this stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. But I'm an ACT guy. Mm-hmm. Like, ACT is comprehensive. You know, I got this. And ACT is so well, um, f- such a, so well aligned with coaching, which is not therapeutic. Mm-hmm. Right. We're not talking about your mother in coaching. Right. We don't even we don't even have to talk about the past at all. Right. Right. And so I'm like, you know, and that was another, I guess looking back, was another core tenet of how I viewed coaching is that we're just future focused. We're just talking about performance, coaching, you know, therapy is about fixing bad things. Coaching is about what are you going to do tomorrow? What mm-hmm. do you want to achieve? What are your goals? Again, it was a very sort of, you know, masculinized, no nonsense, get it done transactional approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I started looking into IFS, I want to understand more. So I went on YouTube and looked for videos and I found a video series on IFS by a psychologist named Tori Olds, who is a great presenter. It's like she clearly spent, you know, dozens of hours on a 20 minute video. Mm -hmm. The sort of thing I would never do. And I really appreciate what other people do. And, you know, so this was a series explaining IFS. And I said, wow, she's great. I'm going to get her on the podcast. So so I emailed and she said, well, you know, I do IFS, but it's really not my thing. I can tell you someone else if you want to. I really do something called memory reconsolidation and coherence therapy, which is I find, you know, a bigger picture. I'm like, well, what's that? So she sent me a, a link to a video, 20 minute video. I watched it and my jaw dropped. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's as if you have been a rock climber your whole life. And then you go somewhere and someone tells you, actually, you know, levitation and flight are possible for the human body. Oh, okay. And but, but how, like what, what was the, the idea was the paradigm was, shift? So the, so the, the, the paradigm has been in psychology, and you know this field way better than I do, but that you can't erase a traumatic memory, Mm -hmm. that that an implicit learning is always going to be there. The grooves have been cut, and all you can do is add competing grooves. Mm -hmm. So like an implicit memory is something that your your body knows or you know without explicit memory is what's the capital of Georgia, Mm -hmm. you know? the state, not the country, just in case people are. Um, so it's not Atlanta. No, it is Atlanta. It is, is it? Atlanta. Is it, it is Atlanta. I was, is it? I, I wasn't sure it was Atlanta. Or no, it's Atlanta. not Atlanta. It's Savannah, right? Savannah, Georgia. I don't think it's Savannah. We, we both have PHPs. PhDs. 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 Um, but we don't know what well, the Well, neither of us Georgia lives is. in Georgia. I thought it was <laughs> Athens, but I, I can't remember. I'm going to call my friend Melanie. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to get more comments on this part of the interview than anything else. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's so, ridiculous. <laughs> right. So, so, but implicit memory is something that we, that we learn because it's the brain goes, this is really important and we don't ever want to forget it. And we want to, t- you know, so a habit is an implicit memory, huh? right? Feel bad, eat chocolate, feel better. Brain goes, oh, okay, we're never going to forget that. Mm-hmm. You know, get yelled at, cry, and develop a pain in your belly, mm-hmm. and then you get sympathy. Got it. Mm-hmm. Right? And we don't know that we do it. Right? We don't, right? If, if, if people understood the things that we do implicitly, explicitly, you know, there, you, you couldn't, the world couldn't have supported, you know, 18 Livingston therapists. Mm-hmm. Right? People would be like, oh, okay, I get it. Mm-hmm. So, the you know, all of the stuff I was doing as a coach was based on, okay, that's in there. And ACT says this explicitly. There's no delete button for the brain. All we can do is set up new grooves. So if my habit is go home and eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's, 
we go, okay, well, how do I reduce the likelihood of that habit? How do I get it out of the house? How do I have other food instead? How do I figure out maybe, you know, um, if I want the Ben and Jerry's, what else could give me that kind of pleasure? But this was saying, actually, science has figured out that you actually can rewrite uh, implicit memories, mm -hmm. but, but you have to do it in a specific way. It's almost as if, if you ever, you ever get one of those, uh, like a spreadsheet, Excel or Google Sheets, that's read only, mm -hmm. and you're like, why can't I rewrite this? Right. I get this sometimes. I'm, I'm working on Google Docs and I don't notice that I've gone offline and Google, unless you download it for offline use, you can't Google won't let you write anything when it's offline. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, pushing and clicking, you know, no, I want it here. I want it here. And it feels like, oh, this is a read only document. You can't you can't. So she rewrite. had a method for rewriting the um, behavioral pattern, the traumatic memory. Yeah. to Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, you double click on the cell. <laughs> And then all of a sudden it's available. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, the, the, the key points are, how do you know which cell? Mm -hmm. How do you double click to bring it, bring the unknown, the unconscious into the conscious? And mm -hmm. then what's the process for? So give me an example. Overriding it. Give me um, an example from your own life or an example with a client. Okay. So a client... Um, I was working with was a, a, a young mother of two kids, um, plant based, pretty healthy, not not like crazy plant based, like not the sort of per, like you know, not, I, yeah, not but, a fanatic, yeah, not a not a fan, not, yeah, doesn't have the 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 benefit of the kind of you know of like you know animal rights or you know, hasn't gone to the conferences, hasn't. So it's like, yeah, I think plant-based is probably a good way for me to eat. Mm -hmm. But so that level of, of commitment to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and whole foods would be better, right? But so I'm still, you know, John, but her thing was she was, she was, you know, shuttling, chauffeuring her kids around and she wasn't that like strict with them. They could have cookies, you know, they didn't eat badly, but, you know, they were eating sort of like what their friends ate. Mm -hmm. And I think the kids were like two and four. Mm -hmm. And so they'd sit in the car and they'd offer mommy food and mm -hmm. she would take it. And she would invariably take the food and eat the food that they were offering her, the cookie, the muffin, the, the popsicle. And so ordinarily I would have been like, okay, well, like, what do we do in that case? Right. What, what the, the, we look at, okay, well, first of all, why are you buying it for them? If it's not good for you, why is it good for them? We do a little mommy guilt, <laughs> You know, and we do it gently enough that she comes to that realization on her own, maybe mm -hmm. if she's not willing to change or maybe the dad gives them this food and it would cause a problem like that. I say, OK, well, what, what can you have in the car so you can say no to the kids and have your own thing? You know, mm -hmm. you want an apple, you want carrot sticks, right? Ba even bars would be, you know, a grown up bars that aren't full of sugar would be better. We would talk about what are you going to say when they, you know, we like. What are you going to say when they say, mommy, would you like this? Right. Because you now you, you, you need the skill. You need a script. We would work on that. We would work on, you know, maybe eat beforehand before you know you're going to drive them. So you're not hungry when they offer it to you. But I had just started doing this work on memory reconsolidation. So what I wanted to get at was is because this seemed like like something that she was really having struggled, really struggling to say no to her kids offering her food in a way that didn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. Like there was something in my gut, like this is, this is more than just, I can't resist temptation. Mm -hmm. So we talked about it and said, well, what, what is it? You know, so, so I used a, a process that was developed in, uh, I think it's been used in many different schools, but the, the, the school I'm learning from is called coherence therapy. And the person I'm learning from, in addition to Dr. Tori Olds, is Bruce Ecker, um, the, one of the co-originators of it. And he, he recommends a technique called symptom deprivation, where you ask the person, what would happen if this, if this didn't happen? So what, mm -hmm. what would happen if you didn't like, be, get into the experience, be in the car, your, your kids have just offered you junk food, and you don't take it? Mm -hmm. Now, what happens? Because we want to see, like, why was why is it emotionally necessary to accept it? Mm -hmm. And what came to her was 
it would be rude. And so, well, where, you know, where, where, where might, what does that remind you of? She says, well, when I was a kid, my parents fought all the time. I was the peacemaker in the family. And I had to make sure that everybody was happy all the time. I was afraid that they were going to get divorced and, you know, my life was going to be over. And so what, we, what, what she realized was that saying no to her kids felt like it was the way to keep her family together. Hmm. That was, that was what, she, that, so that's why, you know, that's why it was implicit. There's mm -hmm. no way she, anyone would have known that, but by asking and helping her like go into this experience, oh, well, now what do I feel? Oh, they're going to be angry. You know, we're going to have a fight. They're not, I'm not taking care of them. I, like for her, having a family and taking care of them meant emotionally that she had to acquiesce to a lot of things that she knew were not good for her. Now, it wasn't <laughs> universal. It wasn't like, you know, she was going to let them, let them stay up till three in the morning and, you know, do shots. Uh -huh. Right. But in this, in this particular case, that was what was coming up. What, was that insight curative for her? N n the insight. So that was step one, right? So it was like du double clicking on that cell. Like uh -huh. that was, that was the emotional that, learning. That's what opens up the cell so that she can get in there and change things around, but it doesn't change it around by itself. Right. Kind of like an x-ray might diagnose where the arm is broken, but you still have to have a procedure to, to fix the arm. Yeah. 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 So, the, so the first thing is to know what the, what the issue was. And, and we could be wrong too. Like you can do this and say, oh, we found it. And then you go and do the process and it turns out that wasn't it. So it's not, it's not like, you know, there's no pressure. You don't have to get it right. And because, you know, you don't know because it ha it has to be verified, mm -hmm. right? Like with, with with almost anything, like oh, I think this really helped, but we want to we want verification. Mm -hmm. So the second step was to bring it into integrate it, so that you know one of the tenets of this there is that you can't change a behavioral symptom unless you take agency over it, mm -hmm. unless you say okay, I'm doing this for a reason, because mm -hmm. because with your work, everybody comes to you a victim of their binge. Mm -hmm. right. no, and, and to the extent that the language and the culture represents that victimhood, the, the cheesecake triggered me, right? The binge happened at three o'clock yeah. as, as, as opposed to, I saw the che cheesecake, it reminded me of these experiences. I did, I reversed my previously established best intent and decided to go against what I had agreed to do before. Um, people right. want to abdicate the, um, free will and responsibility when right. it comes to that. Yeah. Right. Which and, sounds like a tough guy thing to say, but there is all this, this other yeah. component. Well, but yeah. here's, here, here's where it didn't feel tough. Um, what I then applied was called coherence empathy, which is to, we, we looked at what her childhood was like. Well, this is the first time as a coach I'm ever, I'm ever doing anything like this. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't always have to go back. I've worked with people where, we're just working on this situation now or something that happened a year ago or, you know, a future imagined situation. It doesn't always go back to childhood. But when it does, I've become comfortable saying, OK, as a coach, I'm here to help them, you know, get rid of those obstacles. And wh mm -hmm. whatever, wherever those obstacles are, I'm going to follow. I'm not going to be afraid to follow. And I'm also I've talked to you offline about, you know, getting guidance on where am I stepping out of scope? Mm -hmm. Where do I not follow? What are the signs that this is not something that I should be doing? So it's something, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's a different conversation. I just want to kind of say that, that, mm -hmm. that it's something that I worry about. And I've, I've reached out to, to you for, for guidance yeah. on. Yeah. No, no. And, and part of that involves just understanding that if you're coaching, that when you get into the deeper issues, people also need to have a professional counselor to, to help them with that sometimes. It yeah. doesn't mean you can't talk about what they want to talk about. It's just um, you can't represent that you're going to cure them of that, even if you do. <laughs> so, right. And, yeah. and, and that it may bring up things that they're going to need support with. Mm -hmm. Right. That we don't, we, people don't necessarily know. Like, you know, you stick your hand into a bag blindfolded. It could contain marbles. It could contain, you know, knives. Like, you know. You know, you, you, I have to become extremely, exquisitely sensitive to do. P, are people okay approaching this next thing? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and, so, and you, you need to use your 
uh, empathic and conversational skills to help them approach it in small doses. I, I think of it like kind of titrating their anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, you, you monitor how they're responding as they're talking about these things and what the results are. And then you, you allow them to go there little bits at a time until they're really ready to go. To go yeah. 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 Which I think is also something that the, the, you know, the, the macho strain of coaching, like we're, we want results. No, no like you, boom, boom, boom. Let's get it done. Yeah. 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 Right. So, so it's another, another shift. So, so the, the coherence empathy is basically helping the client see how important it has been for them to adopt this strategy, mm -hmm. how, how terrifying it would have been to not keep the family together so that instead of it being, okay, well, you better own this. It's, boy, you know, your body really knows something. Your mind really knows something about how dangerous it is to let a family fall apart. Mm -hmm. And it makes total sense. So that the person stands behind it, not in sheepishness or... It, it eliminates the shame. Yeah. It eliminates the shame. It says that this symptom really did have a survival value and it invites you to begin thinking maybe it doesn't anymore. But it's yeah. not like there's something wrong with me. I don't have to go skulk in the corner and hide this from everybody. Um, yep. But I can look at this and consider rewriting it. Yeah. And if yeah. I just one one uh, letter ch change in what you said, I, I say, and it still does have a survival value for you. So mm -hmm. I'm not the one to say, hey, like oh, the other thing I would have done before is, well, obviously now you see that this isn't relevant. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do differently? Mm -hmm. And what that does is it kind of co it collapses that labile state where the brain is like, so when they get to that point of, oh, this, I own this. About 50% mm. of the time, the person's brain, right? Our brains are basically mismatched detectors. We're always looking for what's not true. What did mm -hmm. I think that isn't true? Like that's mm -hmm. what our brains are always looking for. That's why we scan for novelty, mm -hmm. right? So, so the, it's not like we have to do anything to the brain. About half the time, when as soon as they have this recognition, they also say, but that's not right anymore. I'm mm -hmm. not six years old. I'm a grown up. And it immediately begins, the, the, the brain finds this mismatch, mm -hmm. it finds the error, and it mm -hmm. starts overwriting it. Mm -hmm. And according to brain science, we have about a five-hour window in which literally the brain chemistry and the, the, uh, the, the processes in the brain that do this overwriting. Because we, we, you know, we don't want it to be, we don't want our brains to be overwritten all the time, willy-nilly, mm -hmm. right? Like... You know, if if you're you and I are great friends and one day I cranky and I text you something that's a little bit dismissive, <laughs> you don't want your brain to go, oh, how he's an asshole now. Right. 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 So so yeah. it's good to be very conservative. Mm -hmm. So but so we do have this mechanism of so about, th you know, two to three examples of the juxtaposition where the person then thinks about it a few times and, and experiences it. So it's not just an insight. It's a body. Oh, right. Yeah. That's what I was doing. There's a working through process. Yeah. And, yeah. We, and we repeat it. And I just repeat it by saying, boy, it sounds like you're holding both of these things at the same time. What's it like to know that you have to say yes to this junk food from your kids and also know that, you have other ways of keeping your family safe and at peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and people will say, well, I don't know, it's, it's weird. It's confusing. It's almost like you can, you know. So you step back from trying to get them to do anything. Yeah. It's like, a, um, I've got a metaphor that I use in these situations where I say that if you, I used to want to bulldoze people's walls down. When I would find people's walls, I would just want to bulldoze them down. The yeah. early psychotherapists used to do that also, by the way. Freud used to push on people's heads, try to get them to have memories and experiences that they wouldn't have. And every every type of psychotherapy 
regardless of their ideology, comes to the conclusion that you you need to respect people's resistance in some way and become intrigued about it. Yeah. And so I say if you if you support people's wall, first of all, don't build I build those people's walls until you figure out why they had to build them. Secondly, if you support their walls, then they'll start to peek around and consider coming out from behind them. Um, and I, I that's how I would interpret what you're what you're saying is you approach this with a le level of intrigue and empathy, not a not a bulldozer. Um, yeah. And especially at the moment of vulnerability, where most coaches would get really excited and would say, "Don't you see? You don't have to do this anymore, you fool!" Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, you, you you support them and you say, "Well, what's it like to have these two competing experiences?" And at that point is when your empathy is greatest. At that point is when you're empathy and commitment to letting them make their own decisions and work it through in their own pace. That's when it's, that's when it's greatest. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're, you know, it's, it's, as you said, it's respect. It's, it's really tr trusting that, you know, all these pathologies and maladaptive habits and dysfunctions don't mean that we're broken. Mm -hmm. It means, it means we're really, we're really well, we, we're it's, a, it's a healthy brain trying to do what it was set out to do. That's, I mean, that's what I say about cravings. People think that having really strong cravings means that they're sick, but really, a hundred thousand years ago, we had to be very good at finding food and sources of calories, and we had to associate that with particular signals and triggers. And so, people who had stronger cravings were more likely to survive. It's just a maladaption in the modern food environment where calories are so available and signals are everywhere. Um, so, so you're depathologizing this for people, you're normalizing it, getting them to respect themselves, and then they consider making the choice. And, and the problem with the shame is that when you experience that shame, you are not willing to do the work that's necessary to, you know, double click on that Excel cell and yeah. begin to rewrite the, rewrite the, um, the formula. Right. Right. Yeah. And the other, the other tenet is that the, the, the emotional necessity of the symptom is the core mm -hmm. of it. And I, and I think, you know, around food, I think it's more complicated. I think there's physiology mm -hmm. that's involved as well. It's not just, oh, I, have, I now understand that I eat chocolate for emotional relief. Yeah. Then I can immediately stop eating chocolate because there's physical cravings as well. Mm -hmm. And there's also and another person that I'm really learning from a lot is uh, Dr. Terry Real, uh, who's a, mostly known as a couples therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and he talks about the importance of education, like skills mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So there's a view in, the, in coherence therapy that I think once, once you have this understanding, the symptoms simply disappear. So the, the idea is that it becomes permanent, effortless. And the symptoms don't reappear even in the face of the triggers that used to trigger them. Uh -huh. So that's uh -huh. the verification stage. And for, for a lot of them, for a lot of these symptoms, that as I, I found that to be absolutely true for thing, you know, things like, um, you know, flying off the handle with anger. Uh -huh. it, once you understand, once, once you have reconsolidated the memory around, okay, so anger was useful for this. And like, oh, I have other things. But I think there are areas where skills still have to be taught, where we still have to be a coach who says, okay, well, if you're not going to say that, then what are some things you could say? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, okay, so the chocolate, we understand it. It no longer has the emotional weight, but it still has a physiological pull on you. It still triggers dopamine. Now, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming less and less of, of an absolutist. Like I used to be like, whenever I found it's, something, it's I'm like, like, oh, it's this too. was the answer. Yeah. It's behavior is a multifactorial, has a multifactorial cause. Uh, the psychological term for it would be that it's overdetermined. It's like a bathtub with a whole bunch of different faucets and the temperature is determined by all of them. And you kind of have to figure out what faucets are contributing and hmm. uh, work that out. Howie, I, I have another couple of minutes and I, I would like to save yeah. a couple of minutes to talk to you afterwards if we could. Yeah, Is yeah. there anything that I should have asked you or didn't ask you or um, someplace you'd like people to go or do if they want to consider working with you or just learn a little more? Yeah, you know, aside from who does my hair, I can't think of anything. <laughs> um, I, 
I'll, I'll, I, I can put I can put in the other stuff in the uh, in the intro and outro. So I, I, I would like to say something about you if I could. Um, Howie is particularly attentive to being humble and respectful of other people's work. And I think that, you know, it's the way to be. I, I, tr I try to do the same thing. You do it better than I do. Um, what it what it leaves out, though, is your greatness. What it leaves out is something that you only know when you, you know, Howie has coached me through some things and he's, I've supervised him about things he's done with particular clients. Um, and, you know, H Howie is someone that I would trust with my own issues. There's a very small circle of people that I would trust with my own issues. And you're definitely someone that I would do that with. Um, and, you know, if I were to coach you as a marketer, I would say, I, I, I need you to take ownership more of what you figured out and um, how you've put all of these experts together. Because, man, 10 years talking to one expert a week, that's over 500 different experts that you've talked to and been transformed by and absorbed. And you you read like nobody else I know. I mean, I, I'm a PhD. I, I don't read as much as you do, not nearly as much as, as you do. So I would like to say that Howie is a person who's got a vast store of knowledge combined with um, an empathic drive to put it all together for human change. And, um, you know, he charges reasonable rates and he's, um, you know, reliable, uh, on time, trustworthy. So I, I would, um, I would highly encourage you to connect with Howie while he has time available to, to do this kind of thing. Is that fair, Howie? You know what? I agree. Good. <laughs> Good for you, man. Good I, for you. I, I yeah. was going to, I was going to undercut it in 10 different ways. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm thinking like, I need to do some memory reconsolidation you do. on, on why I want to not own the fact that I'm actually very good at this. Yeah, you're that... very good at this. There, when you come on my podcast, people say that it's some of the most interesting conversation out of the hundreds of episodes we've had. Um, every time I take the time to talk to you about something personal, I feel like there's a kernel of growth and a shift in perspective that I get. Um, I think you have at least as good an understanding of the human mind as any psychologist that I've met. Um, and you know, you have the the right attitude and the right amount of personal work behind you. There are a lot of people who just read stuff and take courses and then go out and try to practice with people. But they, when you're a coach or a therapist, you have to work on your stuff to be able to help people with their stuff. Like if you're just going to be a client, then you can work on your stuff at your own rate. But if you're going to put yourself in the mix with other people and be responsible for other people, you have to have worked on your stuff so you can hold it for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you're one of the very few people I think that really walks the walk with that. So um, I'm glad that you're standing up and agreeing and um, <laughs> not diminishing what we're, we're saying about you. Good. So where, oh, do, where do they get a hold of you? you. Um, email put it in afterwards. Is, is best. I'll put it in hj at plantyourself.com. Okay. Um, just the people, you know, want to work with me. Um, I'm so excited about the memory consolidation stuff that I'm doing. It's it's, it's yeah. taking people deeper. It's fun for everybody. Like this isn't one of these processes that people end up sort of dreading. Mm -hmm. it, it, um, I would love for more people to experience it. Um, I want to do enough of it that I can start teaching it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like... You know, as soon as I learn something new, immediately like my first reaction is, "Boy, I got to tell people about this." And yeah. I have to, I have to um, tamp down on a desire to like start teaching courses in it without having, you know, a couple of years of well, experience under of my belt. Well, you, you, you've got, you've got a good ten or fifteen years of coaching experience, I would say, and I, I think that having done it yourself, taking a course or two about it, would entitle you to begin working with it, maybe with some supervision. Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't think you need many years of doing this yourself before you can facilitate helping other people. Um, and be, be transparent about what your experience is. You know, yeah. don't try to yeah. mislead people or anything. Right, well, that's, um, that's why I'm, I'm being more aggressive in, in, in trying to fill my, my calendar with coaching clients more 
more than I have in the past. Yeah. Right. Like I'm, I'm willing to, I'm willing to take on more weekly clients mm -hmm. because I'm so excited about this work and I really want to accelerate my development through it. Mm -hmm. So for folks who are listening, if, you know, if you're like, okay, I've got this thing I've been struggling with for years or decades, I'm stuck, I'm self-sabotaging, uh, hit me up. Let's, mm -hmm. Let's let's do it. And and Glenn, you've given me some beautiful advice about how to structure it, in, because it's different from the other coaching I was doing. It's different from like the fifteen minutes laser yeah. coaching. It's different from a set hour a week from three to four on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been that's been very helpful in in helping me figure out how to incorporate it. So I'll, good. I'll, th thank you for that. Good deal. Good deal.